Welcome to another edition of the official Jets podcast, the draft podcast presented by Pepsi. Two days away from the NFL draft, we caught up with Sal Palantonio from ESPN. He won't be at the facility, unfortunately, like he is most years in the past. A good buddy of EA's over here. Love Sal Pal. Uh, a great professional, good friend, uh, and a hell of a reporter. You can watch Sal Pal. He's been doing this great work on ESPN, as he always is. But this is NFL matchup draft special. Part two actually comes out April 27th, which is tonight, 10 p.m., ESPN2. He said a certain young quarterback by the name of Zach Wilson, who I think a lot of Jets fans think is the future of their franchise, will be featured heavily on this episode. And with the draft being two days away, I think it's fair, you know, maybe talk about, not, not necessarily mock draft, but it sure seems like Zach Wilson will be the pick for the New York Jets if you're reading the tea leaves from the NFL draft analysts. Yeah, I think everybody thinks the Jets are headed in that direction. And Zach Wilson is he's a supremely talented prospect who is coming off a fantastic season at BYU. Whereas I think last year, if we were having this conversation, maybe people would be talking about Zach Wilson as a flyer on day three. Maybe he's a fourth round pick. Maybe he's a fifth round pick because the athletic skills were always there. Right. And then he put it together last year with right. just, with just an amazing season. And he has very unique skills that other people don't. Yeah. I feel like this is becoming a trend in the draft where there's a player that's maybe looked at as a day three guy. And he soars up the draft board. Let's go to 2018, Baker Mayfield. No, I think at the beginning of the season, he was viewed maybe a third round pick or so. And sure enough, number one overall pick, 2019, Joe Burrow. Yeah. I think I'm, I think I'm saying that right. I think my years are not crossed up, right? 2019, yeah, Joe because, Burrow. Yeah, Burrow. And then this year. He didn't play last season. He was in Cincinnati. Right. Yeah. And, well, okay. I thought, well, no, he was fine. the 2020 draft. Right. That's what gets okay, me tripped I got up. you. All right. I, I, I and then Zach Wilson, 2021, yep. puts it together, soars up the draft boards. It's funny. We actually did a chat on Reddit this morning, right? One of the questions, I think a couple people were asking, what's happened to Fields here? Why is he falling? And I don't necessarily think he's falling just as much as other people think very highly of other quarterbacks in this class. And Fields is probably going to be, uh, in all likelihood, he will be a top 10 pick himself. You're right. go you're just, the 2021 draft is going to be probably remembered by what these quarterbacks do in 10 years, because you're ultimately going to have five quarterbacks probably go in the top 10 picks. Right. And I don't think it would surprise a lot of people if let's just say to use Justin Fields as an example, if he's a number three overall pick, I don't think it surprised certain group of people if it was Mac Jones or Trey Lance either. Right. So I, I think that that this is what makes the draft so great every year. You don't know what's going to happen. And it's truly a mystery, even for the people who are studying the draft, from the beginning of the college football season. So I think you never say never is truly the, like a, a, it's a saying that is used in common everyday life, but it could not be more epitomized than with the NFL draft. So if me and you go to McCool's down the street, a popular ice cream joint here in Madison, I New didn't Jersey. Know that. Okay. But if we go in there and we're looking at ice cream, you might like a flavor uh, like a, a, a peanut butter chocolate chip, and I might go for a sherbet over here or, or something. You're a like. sherbet guy. I like orange sherbet. Why you got a problem with it? No, I, I just <laughs> it's not. I don't. You like, like creamsicle? Not really. Oh yeah, I do. I also have a young daughter, and she likes fruit, and she likes sherbet. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I when you said peanut butter chocolate, that sounds pretty good though. Yeah, so I, that's what I gave you though when we just right. went to McCool's here. Right. But the and point we, is that we got two different flavors, even though we went to the same place. And the point is, what what's going to work for you? What right. you know, it, we're talking about ice cream flavors, but for teams, what's best for your system? What also are the physical traits you're looking for? in a player at that specific position, especially the quarterback spot. Right. I think really for the Jets, the intrigue comes after the number two pick because of yes. your ice cream analogy. We, we don't know what types of flavors for each position the Jets want. And I think that's in like a typical year, you know, if this, if we were having this conversation 
next year even, we'd be like, oh, you know, we think the Jets like this at receiver. If you look at what they did last year, we, we have nothing to base this on. So before we talk about picks 23 and so on, let's hear from ESPN Sal Palantonio. Sal, it's a little different not having you in the building around the time of the draft. The first night of the draft, we were just talking off air. You said that assuming the Jets are selecting a quarterback at two, this is your fourth quarterback selection for the New York Jets? Yes, I've covered all of them. Uh, going back to Mark Sanchez, uh, Geno Smith, Sam Darnold, this will be the fourth one. So uh, hopefully they get it right this time. Uh, Sal, uh, we've missed you throughout the offseason because we always catch up with you, whether it's the NFL Combine, the owners' meetings. Uh, last year, you worked the draft remotely for, I think, the first time in a quarter century, right? Uh, yes. How diff how different was that for you, and uh, what are the plans this year? Well, you know, I, I miss being at the facility. Like I said, I've been at the Jets facility a lot with uh, uh, Todd Bowles, head coach, Rex Ryan, head coach. Uh, you know, I, I go all the way back to being there at Weebu Bank Hall at Hofstra University with Bill Parcells. I've covered a lot of Jets. I mean, Eric Mangini, I've covered a lot of Jets uh, first-round picks. Over the years for ESPN, always did it in person. And the Jets have always treated me like uh, one of their own. You know, I, I get the royal treatment whenever I go to Florham Park, uh, whether it's from Bob of security or the front desk people or the, the cafeteria people or Mike Tannenbaum or the coaches. The PR staff over the years have always treated me great and really welcomed ESPN. You know, and when you, Eric, when you, cover a draft and are embedded with a team like that, you know, you're, you, you really feel like you're part of the process. You get to talk to the coaches and the front office people, and you really get an opportunity to see the inner workings of what goes on with a football team. And you get excited about it, first of all. Second of all, you get to convey what you know, inside information, to fans around the world, but especially to New York Jet fans. And I don't have to remind you that I grew up a Jet fan on Long That's Island, right. went to Sawanaka <laughs> High School, and um, used to take my bike with my brother Jimmy down to Jets practice at Hofstra all the time, watch practice. So, you know, obviously it was a huge thrill for me later in life to be able to get paid to do it instead of, you know, being one of the kids along that day. So it used to have a white picket fence around the – I remember like it was yesterday – they had a white picket fence around the field, and you just rode your bike up and watched practice. It was uh, the coolest thing in the world. That, that is awesome. Yes. I, I always <laughs> love talking to you. That, that, that is really something because um, considering where you came from and where you are now, how proud are you of your career and what you've done in the National Football League? Because you just talked about it. Um people often say, Hey, what do you most enjoy about being in the NFL or working specifically for the jets? And for me, it's always been relationships. Yeah. And you're one of the guys who I consider like extended jets family because you've been here so much. And I, and I do feel like the jets have been family to me, you know, whether it was hanging out in Cortland with you uh, for the summer at Tebow, you know, we would uh, go to Doug's fish fry, play basketball together. Uh, it was fun to hang around with Rex and Mike T and, you know, all the coaches and the players. And, you know, I, I, I really, you know, that was one of the most memorable summers I ever had as a reporter or a person, the relationships, but, you know, going to, going to Hempstead, going to Hofstra, we stop at Umberto's to get a slice on Hempstead Avenue. I'm sorry, on New High Park Road. And uh, then, then get on our bikes and go down Hempstead Avenue and go watch practice and, you know, that was the first football game I ever saw EA in person. Me and my brother and my friends, we took the train, the Metro North, to Yale Bowl and watched the Jets and the Giants. And Joe Namath played in that game. We had, we had seats right on the edge of the field. So if, you know, if anybody knows around the Yale Bowl, it's, it's literally a bowl. And we sat right in the front row in the end zone, and we watched Joe Namath carve up the New York Giants in that game. You know, I, I've, I've actually heard about the Yale Bowl stories from my grandmother and Sal. We, we've never <laughs> met or played basketball. But, my, hey, the, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because my dad grew up going to Jets fans, and he remembers the Yale Bowl clearly. 
Oh, and yeah. he, he, he always told me about the Yale Bowl. And um, he said that somebody – he remembers – he has a vivid memory leaving the Yale Bowl. And some, there was a fence that had uh, – people wanted to get through to get to their cars as a shortcut. So someone brought out wire cutters like out of nowhere, <laughs> snipped, the fe- <laughs> snipped the fence, and everyone just started funneling through there. So that, that's how I know the Yale Bowl. But, That's a you tradition, know, I, Jet fans tradition, man. You know, do whatever it takes. Have yeah, fun. whatever it takes. That's right. You got to get in. I, I, but you I, I know what's know. interesting? When you go back to that Yale Bowl, you think, okay, Joe Namath, they're still trying to find, you know, the heir apparent to mm-hmm. uh, Joe Willie. And um, it's it comes full circle. It really does. Well, you know, I, we're going to ask you about a couple quarterback prospects. But first, you mentioned playing hoops with EA. I'm just curious, what's the scouting report here? Oh, man. (laughs) Let me tell you something. He is a strong young man. (laughs) He's solid as a rock. He's listen, I'm going to turn 65 in June. Okay. Uh, And I remember getting beat up by him. And (laughs) Eric, I never complained. You would hit me and hit me hard. And he's got he he packs a good inside foul on you when you're trying to go to the basket. And I'll tell you what, on the other side of the coin, this guy can bring it. He's got a nice game. And when you need a dagger three at the end, Sal Pell <laughs> is going to give it to you. Eight ball corner pocket? Oh, yeah. No, no, top yeah. of the key. Top of the key. I remember that game, Eric. I was on your team, and you you uh, you tossed it out to me, and I hit, a, I hit a three at the top of the key right over Mr. T. Remember that? Yeah. Wow. And, and I'll tell you what, Sal. You know who you really um, – who really got going when we were playing those games? Aaron Glenn. No you saw the com- Oh, my God. The competitive juices of AG, who is now the defensive coordinator with the Detroit Lions, but obviously a longtime cornerback with the New York Jets. At first, AG was kind of feeling his way out. You could see his athleticism. Then after a little <laughs> bit, it was like he was playing the top receiver in the National Football League. <laughs> he started hitting me, and then I, he didn't think an old man was going to hit him back. <laughs> and then, uh, it got real competitive real quick. And I remember you bringing me aside. He said, you know, that's a former NFL player there. You might want to, you might want to tone it down a little bit. <laughs> and, and Sal was well equipped. Not only was he knocking them down, but after the game, like a good sport, he had his cooler and we had a couple pops on the court. <laughs> oh, I like that. I like that. So, you know, Sal Powell, you mentioned you're going to be home for this year's draft, but Also this year, you have the NFL matchup draft special. Part two is Tuesday, April 27th, 10 p.m. on ESPN2. You have a quarterback uh, that's going to be in focus on that episode, who I think a lot of Jets fans believe will be the future of their franchise and Zach Wilson. What are your thoughts on Zach Wilson and Zach Wilson specifically to the New York Jets? Well, I think Zach Wilson uh, has the potential to be the next Patrick Mahomes. I think there's Mm -hmm. no question about that. Uh, he's got all of those kinds of tools. He has incredible vision of the field. Uh, he has a very quick release. He can, he's very accurate on the run. Uh, he is a creative player, and he can really rip it. You know, I talked to Ron Jaworski about Zach Wilson, you know, because I'm not a scout of a quarterback necessarily. I did watch a little bit of film on him, but I watched a little bit of it with Ron Jaworski. Uh, you know, who, um, of course, I'm very close friends with from our days at ESPN. And he is super high on Zach Wilson. You know, um, the bottom line, though, is this for me. Uh, the biggest lesson from the 2020 NFL season, which was remarkable, and I was on the road for the entire time, the biggest lesson comes out of two places. One, the Cincinnati Bengals, and two, the Tampa Bay Bucks. Let's start with the Cincinnati Bengals. They drafted a rookie quarterback, and they didn't protect him. They put him into empty sets. They didn't run the ball well or often enough. And they left Joe Burrow out on an island. And they didn't teach Joe Burrow that at the pro game, you must get rid of the ball in 2.5 seconds or less. It doesn't matter how good your offensive line is or your protection package is. You can't hold up the rush in the NFL for more than really two and a half to three seconds. And a lot of college quarterbacks, especially young ones, especially first round picks think they have to do it all. And they hold on to the ball and want to make the best possible play or the biggest play that's on the field. You can do that in college. You can't do that in the national football league. 
and Burrow got decimated, sacked repeatedly, wound up leaving this, this, this season with a gruesome leg injury. And he'll, of course, we hope be back. But they have to obviously fix their protection. And the quickest way to fix your protection is not to really fix your offensive line per se, although that helps, certainly. But it's to teach that young man. And the offensive coordinator, LaFleur, that you have there is a smart guy. And hopefully he's figured this out. You must protect the quarterback right now in the National Football League. Lesson number two from the Bucks. The Tampa Bay Bucks protected Tom Brady in Super Bowl 55, and he won the game. The Kansas City Chiefs could not protect Patrick Mahomes, and they lost. A 43-year-old quarterback beat the reigning NFL MVP because one was protected and one was not. And Eric, look at the numbers that we got from ESPN Stats and Information. In 2020, and this is the key final point here, in 2020, NFL defensive coordinators brought the blitz 28% of the time. That's a five-year high. The blitz is coming. It's coming at a high rate, at a historically high rate. You must protect the quarterback, especially young ones, and the way to teach them to protect themselves is hut, hut, ball is snap, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, ball is out. That's the key. And I hope that Zach Wilson and LaFleur and, and uh, the rest of that offensive coaching staff teach that to Wilson and get this ball, the ball out of that young man's hands as quickly as possible. Uh, you always bring the juice with the stats. Those are good numbers and uh, good points about both the Cincinnati Bengals and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers on the other end of the spectrum. When you're in the film room with Jaws, Sal, how rare is that arm strength that you're seeing from uh, Wilson? Because people talk about how the ball just explodes off his hands. It's just, he's got obviously a quick release, but, uh, and I'm not talking about him throwing the ball 70 yards down the field, but him just getting it to spaces quicker than other people. There's no question that he has credible velocity on the ball. His spin rate is extraordinarily high. Uh, and he seems to be pretty accurate. You know, he's college accurate. Now we'll have to see if he's NFL accurate. Um, you know, and the reason why I use those numbers, uh, Eric, is not because I'm an analytics guy. It's because it matches up with what happened in the NFL last season. Yep. Remember, the overall overriding number one lesson of 2020 was quarterback protection. Those quarterbacks that were not protected either got hurt or failed. And those quarterbacks that were protected, and you look, let's go back to the Bucs for a second. Byron Leftwich and Bruce Arians changed the offense to a short passing game in the second half of the year. They used six offensive linemen at the highest percentage of any team in the NFL in two tight end sets. They were determined to protect Brady, knowing that everybody and his brother was blitzing Brady off the bus. And so I think that's the way Brady survived and flourished in the second half of the season. It's certainly the way he went on the road and won three straight playoff games and then won the Super Bowl because he was protected. Breeze wasn't, Aaron Rodgers wasn't, and Mahomes was not in Super Bowl 55. Sal, you've been here for Mark Sanchez, Geno Smith, Sam Darnold, and whoever that quarterback will be at number two. And a lot of us think, that it will be Zach Wilson, and when I say us, I mean Jets Nation. But I'm curious, from your perspective, let's use Wilson as the example. From a kid coming from Provo, Utah, to the bright lights of New York City, how do you think he will fare, and what changes for a college kid going to the pros from wherever that may be, whether it's West Virginia or USC or any school in the country, to New York City? It's a very good question. It's a hard one to answer. And I really don't want to compare Zach Wilson to Darnold Sanchez or Geno Smith because he's his own person and he's going to have to stand on his own. Uh, just hearing him talk and knowing his family background, it sounds like to me that Zach Wilson will flourish in the moment. But you never know because the bottom line is you've got a 2-11 and team that was last in the league in points scored. You've got a rookie head coach and a rookie quarterback. 
and you're basically starting over. And so what the team and the organization must do is relieve the pressure and make sure that it is spread evenly. And this is what I know about Robert Sala. I think Sala understands that, and that's one of the reasons why the Jets were so hot on hiring him. Sala has a big personality who's going to set the tone and take the pressure off of this quarterback. I think that's super important. The more that Sala can absorb the pressure and the spotlight, the less it will be on Wilson at the beginning and allow Wilson to sort of incorporate himself into the National Football League. But there's two really important factors here. One is when you're starting a rookie quarterback in 2021, remember, we're going to 17 games. Mm. All rookies hit a wall because, you know, for the most part, their season is over pretty much after Thanksgiving. Now you're playing an extra five, six weeks of football. So they're going to have to make sure that all across the roster on all NFL teams, but particularly those teams that are using rookies heavily like the Jets will, that, you know, I hate to use this word, this term, but load management will be crucial. You don't want to put too much on rookies in a 17-game schedule. Uh, that's a very good point about the 17 game schedule that that changes go. the equation yeah. everywhere. It absolutely does. You know, you got to find 60, Eric, you got to find 65, 70, 75, 80, 85 snaps during the year where you just take a guy off the field. Now in the fourth quarter, now in the fourth quarter, you're up by 20, you're pulling your starters out. You're not letting them finish. You want to get them rest. You don't want them to get hurt in a meaningless situation. There's going to be a lot of that in the National Football League. And tangentially, parenthetically, that's going to affect gambling, you watch, and fantasy football. On the surface, uh, getting back to what you said about protecting and helping a young quarterback grow, about the offense you're going to run and, and, and how you are ultimately going to help this guy succeed, if it is indeed Wilson. This is a first-time offensive coordinator in Mike LaFleur, but he comes up in the Shanahan system, was with Kyle Shanahan not only in San Francisco, but in Atlanta. Do you like the system? Uh, he'll obviously have his own imprint on it because he's going to be calling the shots, calling the plays. But in terms of going back and looking what they did in San Francisco and in Atlanta, using a powerful run game, getting after people in the trenches, and then getting the quarterback out on the move sometimes with the boots and then doing some play action down the field. I do. I like it a lot. It's successful. It's proven to be successful at the highest levels. Uh, but you have to have the personnel to run it. And the quarterback's got to buy in. And, uh, um, you know, that's going to be a process that's going to take place as soon as they draft the quarterback. And I do agree that it will be Zach Wilson. I, I don't think there's any mystery. So, you know, they have five picks in the top 100. Mm -hmm. Okay, they got two, 23, 34, 66, and 86. So with the second pick, they pick a quarterback. At 23, in my view, they should pick an offensive lineman. They need another young stud starting offensive lineman. And then with 34, take a running back. And if they like a running back that's sitting there earlier than 34, don't be afraid to use some of this draft capital that Joe Douglas has accumulated. They got 21 picks over the next two drafts. If they're sitting there at 34, EA, and they've already got the offensive lineman, and they like another running back, a pass-catching running back, who can give LaFleur and Wilson options because you've got to have options to get the ball out quickly. That's what I would do is I would move up and take a running back or move up and take a tight end or a wide receiver. But if they can get – you know, it reminds me of that draft where Pennington was in it where, you know, you, you could take three – top flight players that could have you. It was Pennington, Abraham, and Anthony, was it? Those are the three, uh, right? An Anth Anthony, back to uh, – there's a 2000 class, the four aces. The four aces, you had uh, Pennington, 
John Anthony. Abraham, Sean Anthony. Ellis, Anthony Becht. Yes, Sean. So, you know, you look at that draft. I mean, that's you know, the four aces, right? So you could get at least three aces uh, here with this. There's a lot of draft capital. And I do think, again, going back to the overall big picture theme of where this team is at 2-11 and 11, with a rookie head coach and a rookie quarterback probably starting week one, the idea is to line up and give that young quarterback quick options off the ball mm. so that he, if you're in a passing situation, he gets the ball out quickly. It's third and medium, third and six, third and seven. He can get the ball out quickly. Or if you're going play action, you know, um, on second down or first down play action. Uh, but if you're on second down and you're second and short, now you have a running back who can run mm -hmm. behind uh, uh, Becton or another uh, offensive lineman that you twin with him. But I think the key is ball distribution and options for a young quarterback so that he remains protected. And also in the 2000 draft, what some people refer to as the fifth ace in the third round, Lavernius Coles. <laughs> Not too bad of a receiver for the New York Jets. Talk talk about strong. Wow. And that, uh, dude, that dude was strong. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he was, and he was pr pretty darn good player for the Jets on oh, both for stints. Sure. Yeah. And you you know you mentioned trading up, and Joe Douglas last year obviously didn't have the same capital that he does entering not only this year's draft, but next year. So we saw some trading back, but I like what you said about trading up. And, you know, do you think that that is a possibility for the jets to use some of that capital and leapfrog a couple teams to get, you know, let's just use the, the term we've been using another ACE for the jets. Well, I think this is Joe Douglas's draft win or lose. Mm -hmm. This is his yeah. legacy on the line, right? He made the big bet to stay at two, and pick a quarterback. He probably could have auctioned off that pick for a mother load of picks, but they realized they didn't want to get into a money deal with Sam Darnold, and so they're starting over a quarterback. I think it's smart. Uh, in my view, I think Zach Wilson, this is me talking based on my reporting, uh, I think Zach Wilson has a greater upside than Sam Darnold at this point in his career. I did not see enough out of Sam Darnold to tell me that in the end, he will be better than Zach Wilson. So I think it was the right move to make for sure, but it's a big bet. Let's face it. It's a big bet for Joe Douglas and the organization. And, um, you know, the, this, the, the fan base has been long suffering. Uh, you've got the, the Patriots on their heels You've got the Bills rising, the Dolphins rising. This is the time to make your move right now. Great stuff from Sal. I've never met Sal, but he seems like a great guy. I've now met him virtually. I'm surprised you've never met him because you've been with us for five, six years now. Yeah, but typically when he's here, you know, for the draft and he's busy and, yeah. you know, you, you catch up with him and I don't <laughs> want to bother him. And so next time he next time he's here, you wouldn't I'll be bothering sure. him. Yeah, he, he's a, he's a legend. To, in this industry, I think. I mean, you look at his career. Right. You know, he's been an ESPN for more than 25 years. Well said. And I think that we do have to talk about pick 23 and 34. You want to give names that you like? You want to give, you want to do a, who you think is going to be the pick? And you tell me, whatever you want to do, I'm open for. Well, I'm not avoiding the question. What I would say is it's hard for me to deliver a pick at 23 when I don't know yeah. the group of players that are there. And that's the exercise that we are going to be doing on the Jets draft countdown final episode delivered by Duncan. So everybody can watch it on Jets platforms because myself, you, Anthony, back there, Eric Coleman are going to go through the exercise where you have five, six players and it's up to us right. to uh, pick a selection there. I've zeroed in on a couple of things. Joe Douglas said he wants to surround his young quarterback with as much talent as possible. Douglas has also reiterated time and time again that he wants to have a fortress up front along the offensive line. He wants to be have a lot of depth and talent on the defensive line. It's big inside the trenches, but the three areas that pop out to me with this draft in the New York Jets, I'll just go there and say offensive line right. makes a lot of sense. Then on the other side of the ball, 
defensive line, specifically edge, cornerback. I think I definitely agree with everything you said. Okay. One position that gets overlooked, and we've said it multiple times on the podcast, and I'm going to keep hitting this home, is linebacker. Not because of the draft, but because the Jets have only a handful of linebackers on the roster right now. And switching from the 4-3 to the 3-4, I think maybe that is the... Like, if I were to ask you to power rank what you think like the, the biggest needs are, not necessarily who should be pick 23, 34, but if you were to say one of the Jets or power rank the Jets' biggest needs, I would think there is an argument to be made that 1A or 1B could be linebacker. I mean, I think it's fair. You're going to add linebackers. Right. I'm, no, not, I'm, just, I'm not saying 23, 34. Th- th- but, but that's my point on this is I, I don't know. We're going to find out, to your point, philosophically, where not only Joe Douglas stands, but the meshing of him with the Robert Sala coaching staff in their systems right. as far as picking players for those specific systems and where is the value. Now, could they take a quarterback, uh, linebacker? They are taking a quarterback early. Could they take a linebacker early? Yes. I'd be surprised by it. The first two or three picks. Same, same I'd be surprised back? by it. No, because that falls into the category of we're going to do everything we can to help our young quarterback to succeed. And I think sometimes we get wrapped up into running backs and think of them. And we talked about this multiple times where I think people are like, oh, you're just going to hand this guy the ball. Well, the thing about ETN specifically early in the draft is I think he would be a system fit. We talked to Dane Brugler about this. And it's also like adding an extra receiver for a young quarterback. Yeah, and you know, I know we both like this player, but you look at some of the running backs later, too. One guy stands out, Kenneth Gainwell, also offers that receiving threat. I think that there are so many different options, and I just feel silly because I feel like we've been saying this for weeks now, but there are so many options at 23, and it's really all going to shake out. And you can move up, and we talked about it. it. if you like somebody who's starting to fall and it could potentially happen because you're talking about a top 10 with five quarterbacks going a couple receivers at least mm-hmm. and Kyle Pitts. So three, yeah, throw, throw the gator out there. So, so who, who potentially, let me ask you this, who potentially could you see slide a little bit further down where you think, well, that might ring a bell around here where maybe you'd consider going up. Because I don't think you just go up to go up. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> to me, I think the guy that stands out is Elijah Vera Tucker. Okay. Fair. Mike T talked about offensive line mm-hmm. protecting the quarterback on our previous podcast. Sal Palantonio talked about the Tampa Bay Buccaneers winning the Super Bowl because they protected Tom Brady and the Chiefs did not protect Patrick Mahomes. Elijah Vera Tucker is considered the best interior offensive lineman in this class. So if you're the Jets and you like Vera Tucker and he gets past the Giants at 11, right? I was just going to ask you, what's the point here? Because I don't think he's getting past 15. So I I heard today on a different podcast, actually Dane Brugler's podcast with Lance Zerline, the over-under is 17 and a half. Oh, interesting. Because, and he was saying, well, who's at 17? The Las Vegas Raiders, who lost Trent Brown, Gabe Jackson, and Rodney Hudson. So could they be in play for someone like Elijah Vera Tucker. Well, I think that if the Jets wanted to make that move, I think they definitely could. I think that's a guy that stands out. I also want to say that- I do like him as a prospect. I will say that uh, any guy that is very good to dominant at guard and then is asked to play left tackle and does it better than anybody out there in the Mm Pac-12, that says something. Like, for for example, if J.C. Horn started falling in the teens, I don't know if the Jets would make that call. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I, well, one, I literally do not know, but two, I don't know if it makes sense to me where you could sit there at 23, still get a good corner or get a different defensive player. And, and I will say in terms of trading up with the ammunition, the jets have a 34 pick gap, pick 34, pick 66, 32, 32. excuse me. And maybe with that extra third round pick, the jets might be inclined to get back up in the second round if a player starts falling somewhere in the second round. I just think that that is also a possibility because the Jets have not only two-thirds, but two-fifths as well, and they got two-sixths. Caleb Farley is a 
intriguing name to me because we've seen him all over the place. How did he check out medically, not only here, but for all the teams? Because he shoot, he's a guy who could go as high as 11. He could drop out of the first round. Yep. We'll be sitting here on Friday and, and talking about Farley being in the second round. Same uh, thing I, with Phillips, right? Jalen Phillips out of Miami. Right. Like, it, would, it I, would it surprise you if Jalen Phillips went 15 or 50? I mean, obviously that would be medical. There would be medical concerns out of came to be true. Most likely in that scenario. Yeah. For some teams it might be, I would be surprised if he went to the other side of that. I think it's closer to 15 than 50 for him. I, I agree with that. Okay. I agree with that for sure. I think that there's so many different scenarios. I, I will say that the one thing I do want to do, you know, a little fun game here as we wrap up, because this is the final episode before the draft. And actually, let's give a quick uh, preview of what's to come. After each night of the draft, myself, EA, Anthony Becht, and Eric Coleman will all break down the Jets selections after each day of the draft. So we'll be back Thursday night, Friday night, and Saturday. Mm -hmm. And we're going to do three podcasts, and then we're going to recap the whole thing. So uh, you got to stay tuned for that. But with that being said, I need to know, because we can revisit this, who do you think Friday, Thursday night will be the Jets' second and 23rd overall selections? Not necessarily who you like, but figured, uh, uh, you even want to play this game? Uh, no, I'll take two. You can take 23. Oh, good. Good. Uh, Thanks. Zach Wilson, BYU. <laughs> the card was turned in. <laughs> oh, God. You know I'm just saying, who do I think? That's that's my it's guess tough. on that. Yeah, well, same with 23. It's tough, right? Because we don't know the board. And and, I, and as much say... as we just discussed about trading up, a trade down might be the play too. If you had, if there's a drop off after a certain point, yeah. there's a there's a few guys that go off, and and then you have a big group of players together. And I always give the example of Mims last year, but. On the surface, initially, that looks like it worked out really good for the Jets. Yep. So, do you think I can give a name? Or yeah, something? go ahead. I lean edge if it's defense. And I'm going to say Aziz Adjilari out of Georgia. I think it makes sense. Listen, defense alignment can never have enough bodies, and he can never have enough fast twitchy guys off the edge carl lawson fourth that'd round, be a nice defensive line too uh, carl lawson fourth round pick out of auburn a few years back um but uh yeah ojalari might be the first edge off the board it's and, possible and when and if the jets took him at 23 he could be you know he could be that guy or is it uh, they aforementioned jalen phillips mm -hmm. or is it Gregory Rousseau. Rousseau might be a find in the second round for somebody. Right. Same with Jason Owe. If you really yep. love his traits over his freakish traits. Yeah. That's the other thing that we got to talk about. I mean, again, we're going to hammer that home is that these guys are going to get here, rookie minicamp, and then they start a new stage. And right. we can't think about any of these prospects as finished materials. They're 21, nope. 22 years old. They're coming to. The respective organizations are starting their career. And that's when the best coaching staffs take the players and they make them into something they envision when watching on tape. These right. guys that you're seeing on college film, it's good. It's just one piece of the puzzle. And that's how we wrap up the last episode before the draft. Again, April 29th, Thursday night. We'll be here Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday. We're breaking down each round with Eric Coleman and Anthony Beck. That's all we have on this episode of the official Jets podcast, the Draft Podcast, presented by Pepsi.